a relatively new development, and that is the use of blind people as paid pasters, or as employees as pasters in various food, pharmaceutical, and uh, other consumer product industries. I have a brochure of information that is sent to me by the National Institute for the Blind with illustrations, descriptions, photographs of the very effective use of blind and or handicapped people as case testers or sniffers or evaluators of products other than the visual aspects of the product. So this will be going around the room during today's presentation. If it doesn't make it to the back of the room by the end of the hour, then it will be in the round table room in the uh, Royal House Hall. Yes. They say they are. And I'm going to show you some slides pretty soon and then raise a point for discussion with you as to uh, there's some obvious advantages and then there's some potential but untested disadvantages. I'll show you the things in the slides. Some other unfinished business uh, relates to an assignment in, in preparation for either the quiz or the final exam. I haven't decided where I'm going to ask the question. I want to ask some questions about experimental designs based upon today's lecture and upon the article by Harrison, which all of you have as the last thing in your laboratory manual. It's called Planning and Conducting Experiments. It's written by Dorothy Harrison, who is quite an expert in sensory analysis of meats and poultry. And this is taken from a book. And I'll give you the reference for the book so that you can have a complete citation. When I had the Xerox copy made for that entry in your laboratory manual, I failed to indicate the complete citation in case you ever want to go back to the original. So that article was taken from the following in the book by Paul and Palmer. <laughs> Many of you use this as a text in 101 100. You didn't have an assignment of that particular chapter in Tools 100, did you? It would be unlikely if you did, because I'm sure you didn't cover experimental designs in Tools 100. It's more relevant to this course, actually. And the book on food theory and applications. just so your citation will be complete. The people who are taking the course as a 198, I have a copy for each of you. And I believe three girls and Dave, I've given you a copy. I have one here for Phil if he comes in today. Okay, let's uh, start the uh, lectures by showing you the photographs that were sent to me from the research laboratory of the Glidden Durkee. Corporation in Florida. And Glidden Durkee, Glidden is a paint company, and Durkee is the margarine and edible fats company. That's what they're primarily noted for. And they are now a combined organization. I'd like to show you how this Glidden Durkee Corporation has been using blind people very effectively as sniffers, <coughs> judging the odor properties of various perfumes, flavors, and uh, tastes. Uh, I'll start by reading to you the little description that was sent to me directly by the organization. So in their own words, Mr. McKibben, who is in charge of sensory analysis at Glidden Durkee, says that the uh, order panel, all panel members are blind. They were hired in 1964 in cooperation with the Florida Council of Blind. As far as we know, we are the only company that has hired blind people to make odor and taste evaluations of perfume and flavor chemicals. Well, that was back in 1964. And subsequent to that, several additional companies, including uh, the branch of General Foods in Canada, is now using blind people. And this little brochure gives the more up-to-date information. At the Glidden Durkee plant in Florida, their panel is split into two four-hour shifts. We believe that the human nose is subject to fatigue, so we work one group for only four hours in the morning, mm -hmm. and another group for four hours in the afternoon. So there are two different groups. So each blind person then works 
a total of four hours a day. All right, could I have the first slide? I think if you turn off the lights, I can work the slides from here. I don't guarantee I can read my text. This is the photograph of the blind sniffers. They're photographed in front of the building at the Glidden Durkee plant in Florida. And as you can see, some of the individuals have other handicaps, uh, physical handicaps, in addition to being blind. This is the sensory booth. If you can visualize that these are two individual partition booths, the slide seems very dark to me, at least from here. Uh, there's a chair here for the person to sit if he faces the counter. And on a counter is a, a mechanical device that he operates by the sense of touch and can answer the questions that are posed to him by depressing an appropriate lever on this box. And I believe the next slide shows how the samples are presented. They're presented in small metal sample boxes with three samples each with a space in between. So it's very easy using your hands alone without the sense of sight to be able to know clearly which sample is being presented. And since they're presented only in groups of three, it minimizes any errors that would be made by, make, by mixing up the samples. The procedure is to take one of these um, filter papers. It's a filter paper strip. And the strip is dipped into the solution of the odor, the perfume, or the flavor, whatever this is. And it's attached to this little stand until it dries on the paper. And then the dried material is sniffed. In some procedures, the judges are asked to sniff the paper while it's still moist with a chemical compound on it, then place it on the stand and let it dry out and sniff it again. So there are various procedures that could be used. So you can visualize how a blind person could easily operate a test such as this. The responses that are given go into this machine that has a keyboard that looks very much like a calculator keyboard with nine numbers and a zero. And the response goes directly onto an IBM card, which the person punches himself. So the blind person is doing all the punching of the data also on this Why are the it isn't necessary for the numbers to be in, in Braille if you know that the first three numbers are 1, 2, 3, and the next three are 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I just wanted to Now, whether those numbers do have depressions in them that a blind person can feel or not, I don't know. But no mention was made about the numbers being in Braille. This is a close-up of the machine. And I noted one thing is I believe the conventional order in most of the calculators I've seen or adding machines is to start with a one here and end with a nine up here. But this seems to be a designed a little differently. It doesn't indicate whether it was designed specifically for blind people or whether it is a conventional punching device. Since it's made by IBM, I would guess it's the latter. It's a conventional card punching device. There's a small hole here through which the samples are served, but it's only large enough to let that tray of samples in. It isn't large enough for communication or shifting through of large pans or tall cylinders as we can in the windows we have in the booths in which you've participated. Here we see a blind person who is placing the filter paper into the solution. And as I said, they can then place the solutions here. And it's very easy then to remember what position everything is in for the corresponding response. Here we see a person who is sniffing the material recording the responses directly onto the machine which punches the card, placing the punched card in the tray that corresponds to the samples that were presented to them, and sending them back to the experimenter on the other side. The experimenter on the other side simply collects the cards, puts them into the computer, and then comes forward with a printout such as this. This is one of their typical printouts. Among the things they ask them is to determine uh, which of two samples is stronger, or in three sample tests, which is an odd sample, a triangle test, or to give a score to each of the three as indicated here. These, for example, are 
panelists one through nine, their average score was printed out here. The total average, the standard error, and then each one has to indicate whether in his response he was guessing, he thought there was a little difference, he's fairly sure, he's very sure, or he's positive of his response. What they're trying to do there is to see how the decision, whether the intensity or the other value judgment, how it's related to the certainty that the individual has about his response. Okay, now, the thing I wonder about in using blind people relates from some data we collected ourselves where, much to our surprise, we found out that when a person closes his eyes, that the amount of saliva that he secretes into his own mouth is diminished by about 50%. Or I could say, well, what does saliva have to do with sniffing of experimental samples? Well, I don't know whether saliva secretion is related to sniffing, but I do know that saliva secretion is related to anything that happens in the oral cavity in the mouth, and it's certainly related to the composition of the food that we take in, things like the starch content, because we need salivary amylase to induce initial digestion, hydrolysis of starch. All right, these are the data that we obtained, when we found much to our surprise that if a person smokes a cigarette in the dark, the amount of saliva that he secretes is reduced very dramatically. So these data are taken from a publication in which we report results from tests on the various things one does when you smoke. Holding a cigarette, viewing the smoke, uh, drawing through an unlit cigarette, smelling the smoke from another person smoking, viewing another person smoking behind a glass door, uh, smelling a burnt out cigarette ashtray, you know, they smell so delightful. All these things we were testing, everything that we could think of was related to the odor or sensory aspects of smoking. We wanted to know, can this be reflected in salivary secretion? All the things we tested, the only thing that was definitive and reproducible and highly significant was smoking in the dark as compared to smoking under normal illumination. And this is the magnitude of the change. These are the four smokers who participated, and we had two non-smokers who smoked for science. This one happens to be me, and I've often said that before I participated on this test, I was just a casual non-smoker. After participating on the test, I'm a devout non-smoker. It was very offensive to me, and also to the other individual. This is the other collaborator. It's very difficult to ask a non-smoker to participate and it always goes through my mind that would we be responsible if they become addicted to cigarettes as a result of having participated in our studies? Would we be a participant in their, their uh, beginning to smoke? Well, at any rate, we wanted to have the non-smoker to omit the possibility that if you liked the situation, you would get a different response than if you disliked the situation. The smokers thought this was great, you know, just sit there, have a small salivary question, cap and mop, and sit there and smoke and relax. They thought it was great. And we thought it was very offensive. But that was irrelevant because the conclusion is the same. When normal vision was operating, this corresponds to how much more was secreted as compared to a baseline resting level where there was no stimulation at all. So this is baseline, this is converted to 100. And this is how much more saliva was secreted from one gland in the mouth, there's six major glands, but this is from one gland of the mouth, when they smoked under normal illumination. Then we took some more resting levels. Then we put black goggles on the person so that he had no light and no vision. And we find that the reduction is very dramatic in all individuals, including the two non-smokers. So for some reason, when they couldn't see the cigarette, they salivated less. The speculation was that viewing the cigarette itself was stimulating. And smokers tell me that they find it rather uh, not unpleasant, but not too satisfactory to smoke in the dark, like in a movie theater or the, um, on a very dark night. They say they don't derive as much pleasure from smoking. That part of the pleasure of smoking is seeing the smoke. <coughs> and even though I'm an unsmoker, I can appreciate that because uh, I appreciate a roaring fireplace it's pleasant to view, even though I'm not a pyromaniac that I know of. Most of us appreciate or are fascinated by fire and flames, like in a fireplace. Okay, so if, if it is a cigarette, we have to establish, is it the cigarette or is it a more general phenomenon? 
Also, we wanted to know was the fact that you wore goggles, the fact that something was up against the face, was this a factor? So we repeated the experiment. We reversed the order of presentation to be sure it wasn't just a time order effect. And we did something else. We had the people wear transparent goggles for the regular illumination and then black goggles when there was no vision. And we have the same conclusion now. This is with black goggles, transparent, black, transparent, black, transparent, etc. And these differences are highly significant. So once again, smoking in the dark reduced secretion. The other thing we did was to collect the resting level in the dark. And that's what these crossed hatched bars are. So this is resting level with transparent goggles. This is resting level in the dark. Transparent, dark, transparent, dark, transparent, dark. So what does this tell you? It's not the cigarette, is it? It's a more general phenomenon. It's probably a central phenomenon, physiological phenomenon that's in the central nervous system. OK. One other thing we did. This is the last one. If that happens for cigarette smoking, it may be unique just for smoking. Now let's get into something that's more related to foods. What about actual tastes? So we tested solutions, and you know by now that those solutions are very sweet, very salty, and very sour, respectively. We took a resting level under white light, under dim, diffuse illumination, about the illumination you have in the room here. Not enough for, so that you can read, but just enough so that you can see objects with the eyes closed and white illumination. This, no stimulation at all. And the lowest one was with the eyes closed. But the differences here are so small, you can hardly come to conclusions. Then our control was a tasting of distilled water with white illumination. There we go. All right, now, response to sugar, salt, and acid under white illumination, regular daylight illumination. Under dim, diffuse light, such as the light in which you're sitting now, with the eyes closed, with yellow lights, with red lights, like the ones you've had in the case booths, and with blue lights. And we finished up with white again. Now, red, yellow, blue, dim, and white. There are no significant differences in the height <coughs> of the bars here. But there is a significant reduction in the response when the eyes are closed. OK, I don't know why this happens. But I raise the point show you these data to indicate that it could be that the blind people are not quite the same as people with normal vision, at least as far as phenomena such as these are concerned. Okay. Thank you. But if they've been blind their whole lives, it wouldn't it would see. Now, Robin raises a good point, and there's no way that we could check it out experimentally. If a person has been blind since birth, then perhaps the condition of, of not being able to see is not unique, either physiologically or behaviorally, and wouldn't induce a change such as that that we mentioned. But there's no way we can take an individual and compare differences unless we took large populations. 1,500 people who are blind from birth versus 1,500 people who are blind after age 21. And if you get significance, then you can assume it's related to the time in which they became blind. On um, the uh, salivating test I took part with the wine um, and the goggles and stuff, did, were we salivating less with the goggles? Yes. Robin is referring to a test where she was one of the victims, uh, experimental <laughs> subjects, where uh, they wore different types of goggles. Like one eye was closed off, the goggle was frosted, or there were just pinpoint holes, or various conditions of goggle uh, distortion of vision. And uh, we tested wine. The reason was that the research was being sponsored by the Wine Advisory Board, so that was our stimulus. And we found, once again, that if, when the person is wearing the black goggles, the response to the stimulation by wine is significantly less than under all the other conditions of the test. So I don't know why this occurs. My speculation is that it's related to attention. Those of us that have participated observe that when we close our eyes and sit there for a four, five, or six minute period, that several things happen. Subjects have reported at least one of the following to me. A, they get sleepy. B, they get cold. C, they lose track of time. They don't know if they've been there one minute or one hour. Uh, a few of them say that they're not certain whether they're sitting at an angle this way or at an angle that way, that they lose their, their uh, not equilibrium, but their concept relation to their environment because they can't see. 
Now, all of these conditions that are mentioned, one individual said that he had a slight case of vertigo. He just felt a little bit nauseated after the experiment. All of these conditions are related to alertness. They're related to falling asleep. And we know that of the one liter of saliva that we secrete in a 24-hour period, only, I believe it's only 180 milliliters are secreted during the eight hours that the average individual sleeps. So if you have 1,000 milliliters secreted in 24 hours, only, a, only 18, excuse me, only 18 of that 1,000 milliliters are secreted during the time we're asleep. Maybe that's a good thing, too, because uh, you know, we could choke if we had to continually swallow during sleeping, perhaps, or if nothing else, we'd wake up with a very wet pillowcase. It doesn't sound too comfortable. Adrian? And the factor of alertness that wouldn't really apply to blind people because they always got their eyes closed, so to speak. I mean, yeah, that's, that's a good point. If you're blind and if you've been blind for many, many years, this doesn't mean that you're sitting there half asleep all your life because uh, they may even be more alert, alert than the rest of us because they have to be attuned to other clues, such as sound. Yeah, if you maybe, if you did something like cover their ears and test them, they might salivate a lot uh -huh. less. But I think as far as the application and sensory analysis and for our information here, that uh, if I were in charge of a laboratory that used blind people, I would feel better if I had a group of sighted people, a large enough group of sighted people that I ran side by side, at least initially, to satisfy myself that there weren't any striking differences, and then proceed to use the blind people who would be more readily available. And then, of course, you in turn would be contributing to their employment, to their usefulness, to their morale. And you know, it'd be a very uh, humanitarian thing for you to do, as well as you deriving a great deal of benefit for your company and yourself. Another question, Brent? Um, is the one liter uh, volume of the last few days after um, seeing for sighted people, or is that just for um, the average oh, In the literature, it says for the healthy young male adult. So it doesn't say whether he's blind or not. I assume he, since he's normal, he's not blind. I was just wondering the um, average is a leader a day. if um, blind people secrete the same total amount. I don't know. And uh, my knowledge has never been tested. But what you would have to do, I would never take 20 blind people and 20 sighted people, make a measurement, and assume that the difference was due to their being blind. I would want several hundred of each before I would assume that it was the blindness that caused the difference. Thank you. Was there another question? In the small amount of literature that's distributed, distributing now in that little blurb that I got from Mr. McKibben, they say that they have a much greater reliability. They don't have an, uh, their absentee rate is almost nil. The person has to be dreadfully ill before he refuses to come to work. They look forward to it. Their morale is very high. The reproducibility of their judgment is very good. But they haven't said whether they ran a side-by-side -side comparison with sighted people and whether they're JNDs or thresholds, et cetera, were equal to or less than. That information they didn't share with you. It's very difficult to get industry to share any information with you. Uh, I'm happy to even have obtained a copy of these slides that they were willing to share with me. They didn't identify at all what it was that they were testing, except that they were either perfume or flavor compounds in solution. Any other comments on using blind people? I think one could extrapolate to the use of any group of people, and that would be if you're simply interested in knowing how a, a group of human subjects react to some stimuli, you don't have to be as careful about who these people are or what some of their physical or psychological behavioral traits are. But if you plan to extrapolate to the consuming public then you better be very certain that your group is representative of the public who is going to purchase your product. I mean, the obvious thing here, which I'm sure would never be done, is that the product passes the odor, texture, 
taste, tactile, etc., quality evaluations of the blind people, and the color is so grim that nobody buys it. I mean, this would be uh, something that they obviously wouldn't do, I hope, but it would be an exaggeration of the sort of error that could be made if they didn't take the precaution of seeing that the public for whom it was intended was represented on the small panel that was uh, being measured. All right, I'd like to go on to the descriptive, I'm sorry, the um, designing of laboratory experiments. Much of what I have to say is already listed on your outline, which I would simply like to supplement. When we talk about experimental designs, what do we mean? Well, that's the explicit procedure, the very specific procedure by which the data will be collected during the investigation. And the purpose, of course, is to provide the maximum amount of information in order to avoid wasting time, effort, material, or money. These are all interrelated, of course. It involves the assignment of treatments to the experimental units and a thorough understanding of the analyses that you're going to do after the data becomes available. <coughs> In other words, before you set up the design, you start thinking of how you're going to analyze the data, not vice versa, or you find yourself in a terrible bind where your statistical consultant says, gee, that was a nice experiment that you conducted for the past year and a half, but it can't be analyzed statistically. Sorry. I don't think that uh, your boss would give you a second chance if you ended up with something like this. So the design is thought through, clear through, and including the total analysis, and even thought is given to what if the data come out in this direction, what does it mean, and what if the data come out in the other direction, what does it mean? Often in sensory data we say what if the results are positive, what if the results are negative, or what if the results show that there's no effect at all? What is it going to tell us? What does it mean? How do we design our test to be sure that we can distinguish among those three alternatives in a sensitive and reliable manner? The best advice in selecting a design is select the design which is the simplest one, which can be analyzed statistically by a straightforward, simple analysis. It's just common sense, isn't it? Select the design which can be analyzed in the most straightforward, simple manner. When we apply the statistical methods to the design of an experiment, we have to remember several things. The first one, of course, is that uh, the analysis of the data calls for very clear thinking. A person who is uncertain of why he's conducting the test is uncertain about the homogeneity of his samples, or the history of his samples, is uncertain about the reliability of his judges, and only has a vague idea of how to design a scorecard, he certainly is not thinking very clearly, and his data are also going to be pretty muddled. The other thing to avoid is just the routine application of statistical procedures. There are individuals that think of statistical designs in terms of a conditioned response. If you show them the data in two columns of numbers, they automatically say, oh yes, if you have two columns of numbers, you automatically apply students' t-test. They don't even look at what the columns are, what they say, how the data were collected, or what results they hope to obtain. They see two columns, and it cranks in, and it, and it spills out like a robot. Two columns, students' t-test. More than two columns, analysis of variance. Well, this could lead to the misuse of statistics or the misinterpretation of data. Okay, say that you are a hot shot statistician or you're collaborating with one, you still have to remember that the statistics do not increase the validity of the data. The statistics assist you in interpreting the data. They don't increase the validity of the data. When one consults with a statistician, which would be the typical situation that people such as myself or people such as you, if you go into a food industry, rather than you being the resident statistician, it's more likely that there will be someone else who is a biometrician statistician or they have uh, brought in a consultant from outside to consult on statistical problems. When you consult with them, you have to be able to speak their language and clearly state what the objectives of the experiment are. Remembering that you know the commodity you know the limitations of human behavioral capacities and responses, and he doesn't. 
So if he says, oh yes, that's delightful horseradish, serve 15 samples at each setting, and we can analyze the data beautifully. Well, you know something about horseradish, and you know something about human behavioral responses to that type of stimuli. You know you can't serve 15 samples at one session and get reliable information, even though he can analyze it statistically. We have to consider the physical limitations also. If he says, uh, well, if you have 173 people, you can get enough replications to analyze this in a complete block. And you work for a company with 20 people. Where are you going to get the other 153? These are obvious things. Also, if he says that uh, it's going to take 752 sessions to collect the information, and your boss wants the information next Friday, I think you're going to have to make some compromises. So these are sort of exaggerated situations that would illustrate how you have to know a great deal about the project, the commodity, and the judges in order to communicate with a statistician. One of the main things in selecting a design is to avoid confounding. And I have confounding listed there under 3B. And an example of confounding is, suppose we develop a new product that uh, increases the storage stability of cottage cheese, for example. So we have an experimental sample and a control sample. And to show you the exaggeration, to illustrate it, say we used a train panel in Cruise Hall to evaluate the control, and a train panel in Roadhouse Hall to evaluate the treated sample. This would be pretty ridiculous, wouldn't it? But if you did that for some reason, you have one group of judges doing the control, another group of judges doing the treatment. Uh, another one that's almost equally gross is if you had the uh, experimental sample evaluated in the morning and the treated sample evaluated in the afternoon by the same people. Then you have time of day and treatments compounded. The most uh, obvious type of confounding that I've observed in the printed literature is the substitution of one judge for another. In that case, then, the treatments are confounded with the judge. If, for example, you have 10 sherberts, as you did yesterday, and Gail evaluated the first sample, and Boyd the second, and Barbara the third, and so forth, and then I reported the data in terms of the average score, we would have the samples confounded with the judges. That is the most common mistake that is made. I understand why they make that mistake. They get started with a project, they have their 10 judges, and the second day of the study, uh, one judge is called away to Minneapolis, and the third day of the study, that judge has a fight with his wife in the morning, he's all upset and can't come to test, and another judge is fired the following day, another judge is ill, etc., etc. Another judge becomes angry with you and walks off and doesn't return. These things can happen. Then you're faced with a decision. Do you substitute a judge? Do you eliminate that data? Do you start all over again? What do you do? And the line of least resistance, of course, is ignore judges, let's just report the averages. But in that case, then, your data, the treatments are going to be confounded with judges. What I prefer to do when, ha when I have an opportunity is to train more people than I really need. If I feel that I need 16 people for an adequate panel, I'll train up to 24, run them all the way through. If someone misses sessions, if it's a commodity that I can give them a makeup the next day. If I'm working with canned peaches, I can open the cans the next day and give them the set that they missed. If I'm working with meat samples, there's no way that you can do that. If you're working with fresh fruit, there's no way you can give those samples. They change with time. Uh, then if you can't make them up, I would prefer that that judge be crossed off all the way back, his data be crossed off all the way back and not be utilized so that in the end result, Every treatment has been evaluated by every judge an equal number of times so that everybody has an equal chance to contribute to the validity or the lack of validity in the data. That's the ideal. Life is not always ideal, and you have to make compromises sometimes, but I think we should aim for ideals anyway. Well, whenever possible, we should run a control sample. If you're attempting to improve, improve a commodity, obviously you would run the control to see whether you've accomplished that purpose. If you're developing a new product, run a control sample that is as similar to the new product you're developing as possible so that at least you have a benchmark, an anchor point. 
And one of the most sensitive tests you can use when you are developing a series of products or you're looking at a series of formulations is to have each one of the formulations or treatments evaluated in terms of deviation from the control. Those of you in lab, perhaps you might recall when you had to view the catch-up samples, I think it was lab number one, you viewed those and evaluated them in terms of deviation from the control. In essence, it's like a paired comparison force choice, isn't it? Because the control, if, if it were the visual sample, you could pick up the control and move it along and compare it directly against the experimental sample. There are many commodities for which there is no control because there's no other prototype that's similar to it in the market. In that case, if it's irrelevant to compare it against a given sample, then at least you can do a psychoanalysis of the sample on an absolute basis, break down its sensory properties in terms of the visual properties, describe them, the tactile properties, describe them, olfactory, texture, etc. So at least you have a profile or a picture of what it's like, even if there's no other counterpart for it on the market. It's a good policy to have a hidden control if you're serving a series of samples. Say you have a control sample that you can call C, and you're giving experimental samples that um, you may have numbers or letters or something to identify them. You're going to present these, and you want the judges to tell you how much each of your experimental samples differ from the control or the reference. It's always a good idea to stick in the control as one of the hidden coded samples. And the reason for that is the amount of deviation from the label control to the hidden control is an index of the variability of the panel. It's an index of the variability of your judge. And you could eliminate from your study any judge who deviates significantly from the hidden control. Because obviously, if he can't tell <coughs> that the control is the same as the control, then of what value is his judgment relative to the experimental samples? So that's always a good index of the reliability of your panel. It tells you something about your measuring device. We have to be very careful in what we conclude from the data, too. There's one very humorous example of how data were misinterpreted. It seems that uh, an individual was interested in the relative effectiveness of alcoholic beverages in inducing intoxication. So he tried gin with water, and he tried uh, bourbon with water. And uh, tried something else, rum with water. And he found that the people who participated all became intoxicated. And his conclusion was that since the only thing these had in common was water, that water is very intoxicating. <laughs> now, you know, very silly, but I've seen manuscripts that were submitted for review where the conclusions were based upon this type of erroneous thinking. Another type of erroneous thinking that comes in the analysis of data often is seen with correlation coefficients where two factors are observed to change simultaneously and the experimenter automatically assumes that there is cause and effect. I think we mentioned this in 107A. The typical example you read about in the statistical literature is variously stated, but to the effect that uh, there's a positive correlation between the number of storks in Holland and the birth rate in Japan. Therefore, the storks in Holland are delivering the babies to Japan. <laughs> We want to allow sufficient time and sufficient sample for adequate replication. Those of you that participate in the lab experience perhaps can see the value of replication. Uh, there's a tendency when you first test a product that the novelty of the situation sort of puts you a little bit off balance. You don't have a reference point. You're not, you don't know what to expect. The second set or the second sample, you feel a little more confident. And by the third or fourth set or the third or fourth sample, you have a better idea of what you're doing. And this is what we mean by replication. We want replication to decrease our experimental error and to decrease that effect due to learning. We anticipate a judge to learn something by participating. But we want him to stabilize his response so that the differences we obtain are due to his perception, not to his learning. 
Okay, how many replications do you need? Now that's a rough question. I'll give you an answer that you'll laugh at. The, the true answer is enough so that additional replications will not change your conclusions. Enough so that additional replications will not change your conclusions. All right, that's sort of facetious because you know this after the fact. You don't know it in advance. But there are some guidelines. Let me put it this way. You will need more replications under the following conditions. If there's a considerable variability in your sample, you're going to need more replications. If you're working with milk or wine or orange juice that is very homogeneous, you're going to require fewer replications than if you're working with uh, fresh asparagus or fried chicken or beef steak or something that is very heterogeneous. You'll need more replication if there is considerable variability among your judges. If you use untrained judges, you're going to need more replication than if you use trained, because there's much more variability among untrained people than trained people. Sometimes your judges show a lot of variability due to other factors, such as poor attention or lack of motivation. And the lack of motivation might be our fault as leaders of the panel or as a head of the laboratory. It could be that we have not made certain that we have good rapport and good diplomatic relations with the people who are constituting our panel. And because they do it reluctantly or with disinterest, they're going to give you more variability and you're going to need more replication. So it pays to not only train your judges, but to maintain a very good rapport with them. The best way to, re to establish the initial rapport is to demonstrate by word, by action, and by example that this is a professional operation, that you are a professional individual, that you know what you're doing, you know what you're talking about, you have confidence in yourself, in your ability, you're a scientist, you're not just playing around in the laboratory, and you obtain their respect as a professional. Then the rest comes quite easily. It helps to have a cheerful personality. And when worse comes to worse, it helps to send the best-looking technician out to get the judges to come in. Not meant to be a chauvinist here, but... There are some individuals that uh, will not come to judge at the designated time until you do go get them, which has indicated to us over the years that these people require a little additional attention. It's not that they're disinterested. It's not that they forget that they derive pleasure from being personally invited every day. And we recognize this and we oblige them because we do need their, their support and their cooperation. So we trudge up and down the steps and invite them. Uh, please, this is time for tasting. Rewarding them after tasting is a highly motivating factor, and I'm sure Dr. Amrine has mentioned these in previous lectures. Another condition where you would need more replication is if the task is very complex. The more complex the questions are, the more difficult the samples are to evaluate, the longer the session is, all these factors would increase your variability, and so you would have to have more replication to get more validity. Or if the test material is very fatiguing, you can see for yourself in those samples that you tested that fatigued you, for, for whatever reason they fatigued you, it's likely that you had more variability. Okay, let's give some general guidelines so that we don't leave you in limbo about how many replications. Just general guidelines. How many would you need? If you have a highly trained panel, individuals who have several months, if not several years of experience with the commodity and with the test method, and they are evaluating the samples in considerable detail, for example, as you do in the texture profile or the flavor profile, then one could say use four to six judges, have three to five complete sessions per variable, per treatment, and this will give you an end of somewhere between 12 and 30. Now, under the conditions I said, it's, it's respectable and acceptable if you're working towards an end of 12 to 30. Four to six judges, three to five sessions. 
All right, if you have just a moderately experienced panel, these could be people who have experience with another commodity, but not necessarily with the commodity with which you are working, or they just have a casual introduction to the commodity or the design, then I'd recommend having 12 to 20 judges. Again, three to five complete sessions, and that will give you an end of between 36 and 100. If you have a group of untrained people, the first time they have ever set foot in your laboratory, then we would want to have uh, anywhere from 50 to 100, depending upon how many are available to you. And you would like them at least two sessions, if possible. Hopefully more than one, so that they can get over the novelty of the situation. And then, of course, this gives you the equivalent of, of 100 to 200 judgments. Industry frequently does this, and they refer to this as a pre-consumer panel, or a consumer-like panel, or a pilot consumer panel. In other words, they don't want these people that have all these years of experience and built-in biases. They want to take someone with no prejudices, no biases, just come in and say what you think. And they'll pick up 50 or 100 people who work in their organization, if there are that many, or the wives of the people that are working in the organization, wives or mothers or sisters-in-law, whatever. Or they might go out to a, a supermarket or a public place and obtain data. That's now, is that three to five sessions, is that one that you're going to count your data that isn't the first, second, or mm -hmm. like if you're out the first Yeah, one, that's a good that point. Thank you for reminding me. Less we ask is, does this include the first day? I would say no. I would call session, the session number one as orientation. Or if you want to call, a, you know, session minus one as orientation, then have three to five complete sessions of collection of data. Now, it could be that your product is such that once they've tasted it, they won't come back again. Then you may not be able to do this, or you may have the information you want from the first session. You know, it's lousy, forget it. <laughs> Might be the conclusion from one session there. When these data are reported, the averages should always indicate how many judges and how many replications, because obviously it makes a difference whether you had 10 people paste once or one person paste 10 times. Your n is still 10, but it makes a big difference in what the data means. So one usually indicates, for example, on a graph or on a table, you'd say n equals 60, and then you would have uh, 10 often they abbreviate subjects like this. Ten subjects, um, six replications. Often it's listed like that. Okay, say that uh, you're, in, you're working for a spice company or an ingredient company, and you're in charge of the sensory analysis of black pepper and ginger and horseradish and mustard and many of these highly, highly flavored, pungent, strong commodities, and that they're developing large numbers of these in the plant. They develop uh, 12 different varieties of the horseradish, uh, 45 different types of uh, black pepper combination with other spices and so forth. How do you evaluate them? There's no way that you can place them in a complete block design so that when a judge comes into the booth, you give him all 40 samples and ask for an evaluation. It obviously has to be broken down into groups. How do we break them down into groups? Well, one way is to use a design, a randomized, incomplete block design. And there's an example of an incomplete block design situation on pages two and three of the handout. Would you take a look at page two? Page two is derived from the book on experimental designs. It shows you the different types of balanced, incomplete block designs. Now, to be sure that, that you know what these words mean, they aren't just terms. Incomplete, of course, means that not all the treatments appear at the same time. Not all the horseradishes are served at one session. Balanced means that every sample is evaluated against each other an equal number of times. Your design is totally balanced. So that each treatment is compared against each other an equal number of times. 
Okay, this is the index to the types of incomplete block designs that are available. If you think about permutations of numbers, you know that there aren't an infinite number of ways that you can put things together and still come out even. Here are the numbers of, of designs that are available on an incomplete basis where you do have balance. Okay, the column that says T, that's the number of treatments or the number of samples. That would be equivalent to the 10 sherbets that you had yesterday in class. Say you had 10 sherbets. All right, say with those 10 sherbets you wanted to present them uh, only five samples at a time rather than 10 samples at a time because you had too many. You wouldn't arbitrarily say, well, this happened, this happened. To do it in a balanced design, you have to go to the table. You'd look under T equals 10 and you'd look under K equals 5 because K is the number of treatments or samples per session. I call them sessions because I'm talking about sensory data. The book calls them blocks, that's the statistical term. Okay, see where k equals 5? Under r, that tells you that if you use that design, you're going to obtain nine replications for each sample. Under b, b tells you how many of these blocks you're going to have in the design. You're going to have 18 blocks. All right, now that tells you that you either have to have 18 people come in and paste once, or multiples of 18, you know, nine people twice, or whatever else divides into 18. All right, there's a uh, Greek letter there. What's that Greek letter? I can't Lambda. Yeah. Lambda, yeah, thank you. My Greek is very bad. Um, lambda, that's the number of times that any two treatments appear together in the same block. Any two ice creams would be in the same block together uh, four times. Then the efficiency of the design. The efficiency says, if you say that a complete block design gives you 100% efficiency because everything appears against everything else, that one that we're talking about here gives you 89% efficiency. Then where it says type, I don't think that's too important for us at the introductory stage. It refers to whether the designs are arranged in replicates or group of repl replicates, etc. Okay, now just to be sure we understand this, Let's assume that we have uh, 13 samples of black pepper. There's an arrow there, and it's 13. What is your estimation of how many samples of black pepper that you could sniff at one session? Oh, your guess is as good as mine. Assuming that you and I have never done this before, what would you say? Three or four? Okay, we could do three or four. We couldn't do five. Why? There's no permutation of numbers that will give you a, a balanced and complete block if you serve five. So you have to serve either three or four or nine. Those are your only alternatives. Nine is too many. So I presume either three or four. Uh, I would try four first, and if it works, okay, because it's going to be more efficient than if you try three. All right, say you try four. You'll have four numbers of treatments per block. You will get four replications per sample. You will have 13 blocks. Okay, how many judges are you going to need? 13. And there's no other number. You can't divide it up any other way. You're going to need 13 judges. It tells you this automatically. Okay, and each sample appears against each other's sample six times. And the efficiency of that, is it six? One time, sorry. The efficiency of that design is 72% as compared to a complete block that's 100 <laughs> Your bifocals are better than mine. Thank you. 81%. I did it on purpose to see if you were listening. <laughs> does, does that seem clear, what we're doing? Okay. Let's see. Oh. My graduate student, Louise Tano, is having that precise problem. She's working with beer. She has to have 16 because of the, of the experimental design. She's running about 20 people, and she's trying to anticipate who is more likely to drop out than somebody else, because each person has his specific set, his specific experimental design. You can't just run four extra and then plug them in, because you have to plug them in into the blocks that correspond to the sets that he's supposed to receive. It's very, very difficult. If a person misses one session, it's not so bad, because if you have a series of numbers and you have a blank. The way you can take care of this blank is to average all of these and put the average in here. You can generate a number by putting the average, say it was 
You put the average in there, and you have a complete block then for your analysis of variance. You don't have any holes for your analysis of variance. And you haven't changed the average or the conclusion that you draw about the judgment of the experimental sample by putting the average in for the one bit of missing data. But I would be very reluctant to substitute, to do this more than once, to put in the average more than once. So it is a big, big problem when you're working with an incomplete block design. The best thing is to work with complete block designs if you possibly can. They Question, why does this limit the, number, the particular number of judges in the panel? You have to have 13, each judge has to do 13 replications. No, you have to work in multiples of 13. You can have one person come in 13 times. Yeah. Or you can have 10 people come in 13 times. It has to be a multiple of 13. Yeah. Or if you're going to do it once, then you need 13 people to come in once. Oh. As long as it, you, it's based, based on the multiple of 13. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. To make the blocks all come out even. Mm -hmm. I right, take that block of, F of t equals 13, and it's described on the third page of your handout. And this, is, this is what the designs look like when you look them up in the book. This is that plan 11.21, where t equals 13. You have 13 treatments. Each treatment appears three times. There are uh, six replications. There's 26 blocks. Each treatment appears against each other once. 72% efficiency. OK, those are your 26 blocks. And it tells you specifically how the samples are being treated. The individual who receives block one receives samples one, three, and nine only. Now, you can randomize one, three, and nine in the order of presentation, if you wish. So this design then would mean that you have 26 people come in once, or whatever the corresponding multiple is, 13 people twice, or whatever the, the multiples would be. And those are the samples you have to serve them. This means then that once a block has served, has been served, that it never appears again within, within this design. And when you have completed this block, then you have an N of six, they call it R, replication. So your average is based upon an N of six, which isn't very large, is it? But it's an awful lot of work to serve all these samples and only come out with an N of six. So that's why I say whenever possible, use the, the complete blocks rather than the incomplete blocks. The incomplete blocks are a lot of trouble. They're very, very difficult. Then they require a different statistical analysis, and that's why I want you to read the article by Harrison in the book by Paul and Palmer because it shows you an example of how you partition out the sources of variation in your analysis of variance to analyze for blocks or columns or rows in the experimental design. And there, sometimes you cannot pull out certain data because you have, for example, you have judges confounded with blocks in this type of design. But there are two examples of analyses of variance that are much easier for you to read at your convenience than for us to discuss in the class relative to how you have to <coughs> modify your analysis of variance of the data collected in an incomplete block design. Kathy? If you, okay, if you have these 26 judges, you mean like each judge is only going to do that one instead of three, and it's going to be done? If you feel that you can live with six replications for treatment, then you can have 26 people come in once and do this whole block. And judge number one will get block one, which are samples one, three, and nine. If you feel you can live with that situation, that, that gives you enough reliability for the intended purpose of your experiment. How do you, so, what's the n equals six? Like, there's 26 uh, at the top it says r equals six. That means that you'll have, if you do all 26 blocks, every treatment will have been tested six times. So that when you average your data, you say the average is equal to something that's based on an N of 6, or they call it an R, which is replication. If any of you have uh, difficulty understanding what is meant by this, be sure to, to check with Kathy or check with me before the quiz. We're going to have some questions relative to the use of an incomplete block design. It's either the quiz or the final. We haven't decided yet. But if you're not certain, be sure to check with us. It's pretty important. Yes. Then what that's saying is that if each one of the judges is going to test every block. No, unless each judge receives all 26 blocks, the judge is not going to have a complete set of all possibilities. Now, if you have everyone come in 26 times, 
and you keep track of what everyone tests on each session and each day, at the end of 26 days, you will have a complete block for each person. Then you can analyze for judges separately from blocks, because then your judges and blocks are not confounders. You still look puzzled. <laughs> no, you might be confused if you're not confounded. <laughs> I'll be glad to go over this during, uh, anytime you want to come and see me or, or at a special session or during a review session if you like, after you've had a chance to think about it and take a look at these designs. It takes a little while for it to soak in. But the, the type of question that we would give you is not going to be an unreasonable one. The, the type of question is that we'd give you this information and say, all right, you have, a, you have 37 pill pickle samples. How would you set it up for scoring of the intensity of saltiness and sourness? And so you have to use this particular design. Under no means would you memorize this information, never because you're very likely to make errors if you try to memorize things like this and need them. I don't understand the efficiency. The efficiency, it's relative efficiency. If you say that presenting everything at once is 100% efficient, you couldn't be any more efficient than that, statistical efficiency. Then when you start breaking them up into groups, it becomes less efficient statistically in terms of, in terms of everything having an equal chance of being influenced by the total variation possible. Variation due to judges, due to time of day, due to homogeneity of samples, due to the temperature of the room, that sort of thing. You decrease your, your statistical efficiency, and you increase a lot of different types of mechanical and logistic problems by going to an incomplete block design. But in some cases, you have no choice. An example that my graduate student is, an example of my graduate student, Louise, she's working with uh, up to 32 samples of beer in her experimental design. And as much as the judges love her beer, it's too many samples to test at one session, even if they don't swallow. So that is a very cursory introduction to experimental designs, but the topic does go beyond the confines of this course, so we simply want to introduce it for your thought anyway. And I want to call your attention now to the descriptive sensory analysis outline that I have here, because there's a slight change in our plans for next uh, Tuesday. Normally, I would give the lecture on descriptive sensory analysis on Tuesday, and then on Wednesday, you go into the laboratory, those of you in the lab, and you participate in a descriptive sensory test. But uh, a few weeks ago, I had a telephone call from Dr. Herbert Stone, who was head of sensory analysis at Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park. And he and his colleague, Dr. Seidel, had been modifying the conventional Arthur D. Little flavor profile system and modifying it with some very decided improvements, in my estimation. They have been applying it for the last two years in various industrial laboratories and have uh, perfected it and they're ready to tell us all about it. So he calls and said, so would you like me to come and talk to your students about our new descriptive sensory analysis? I said, I'd be delighted. He says, oh, he says, you're just trying to get out of a lecture. I said, no. He says, when there's an opportunity for someone who's uh, much better informed than I to give that topic, I certainly welcome them. And also, I'd like the class to have as much uh, feeling for industrial application as possible, which is difficult for those of us who have only university backgrounds to present to you. So nonetheless, I give you the outline of what I would have discussed and ask if anything on this outline is not clear or is too brief and you want additional information to consult those pages in Amory. I'd like you to read this before you come to Dr. Stone's presentation. What I've described here is the conventional flavor profile descriptive analysis of the Arthur D. Little Company. And I want to call your attention to just some highlights here. I'm not sh sure how much Arthur D. Little charges a company to train their personnel.